Tomorrow, the first witness takes the stand in the Tanya Craft child molestation trial. This morning, a Cadusa County jury was seated to hear the case against the former kindergarten teacher. She is charged with sexually abusing three young girls at her home in 2008. Seven men and five women will hear the evidence against Kraft and determine her guilt or innocence of the 22 charges filed against her. This afternoon, during opening arguments, both sides made passionate presentations. It's not some website, it's not some slogan, it's not something on a bumper sticker. It's not some selfish, self-interested truth. It's an absolute truth. It didn't happen. It couldn't have happened the way they said. It doesn't make sense. It's expected the alleged victims will be the first witnesses called by the state because we've been told videotaping will not be allowed inside the courtroom tomorrow. Late this afternoon, a judge dismissed a juror in the Tanya Kraft trial. He says the man violated his order not to discuss the case. Good evening. The first full day of testimony in the trial brought some twists and turns. The kindergarten teacher is accused of molesting her children, her children rather, her own students. The day began with a child actress who is an accuser taking the stand. Before that, the defense team was threatened with a fine for allowing Truth for Tanya stickers in the parking lot. And our legal analyst will discuss the case of the dismissed juror. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Melidia Cluel is live outside the courthouse in Ringgold. Melidia bring us up to date. Well, it has been a very busy day here in Catoosa County. The bulk of the day was spent uh, listening to the testimony of a nine-year-old girl, the first witness called by the state. She is the original accuser who came forward saying that Tanya Kraft had sexually molested her. As mentioned, she is a professional model and an actress. Much of the day was spent going over her resume and her training to be an actress and also her memories of her teacher, Tanya Craft. Lead counsel for the defense, Demosthenes Lorando, started questioning the nine-year-old girl on the stand mid-morning. She told the court she didn't like Tanya Kraft and went on to detail graphic sexual abuse. She said Kraft fondled her in the bathtub and told jurors that the tub was the only place where Kraft touched her. By mid-afternoon, the girl's story had changed substantially, telling the court the abuse happened in the kitchen. Her description of the fondling had also changed, prompting Lorandos to ask, are you sticking to that story or are you going to change it? In response, the girl said, I don't know. Yeah, this is right. Most of the questioning centered around the girl's acting resume and training she received to help her rehearse and remember script lines for her movie roles. Larandos also showed the girl more than a dozen items, including thank you cards she'd sent Tanya Kraft that she'd signed with her name and the words, I love you, and photos of Kraft and the girl who served in Kraft's wedding party. When asked if she remembered anything else about the creepy things Kraft allegedly did, the girl answered, no, but I do remember she used to mow the lawn and she'd wear really short shorts and a bra whenever she was mowing. As we said, testimony was cut short. More child interviewers are called to the stand in the Tanya Kraft trial. The defense wants to know if these advocates planted an idea of molestation in the minds of the young accusers. Hello again, everyone. This is day seven of that trial, and the defense is keeping up a relentless pace. The ex-kindergarten teacher is indicted on nearly two dozen counts of child molestation. This afternoon, it became heated between the defense and a child advocate who interviewed the accusers. You'll also hear from a mom who says she befriended Kraft immediately after she was hired at Chickamauga Elementary. And there's no national media coverage of this trial. Our legal analyst weighs in on that. Team coverage begins with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Callie Starnes, live in Ringo. Melidia? Oh, I'm sorry, Callie, go ahead.
That's okay, Cindy. Uh, Melody is here with me. We'll get to her in just a second. Uh, court just wrapped up about an hour ago. The woman who interviewed the three girls who have accused Tanya Kraft of child molestation, she was here. She took the stand and gave shocking testimony. Susie Thorne is a former greenhouse employee. She was working at the Advocacy Center in Dalton when she said the lead investigator in Kraft's case asked her to interview the three little girls. The prosecution went first and then defense took over asking for foreign questions. Kraft's team showed the taped interviews with the girls and then went line by line through the transcripts. There were several times in the video Thorne introduced terms like good touch, bad touch, and then she asked one of the girls 16 times if there was anything else she wanted to say. Thorne told the defense it wasn't her intention to put ideas in the girls' heads only to get information. Then we learned not everything one of the little girls told Thorne was on tape. When I ask you about the documentation, that does not appear in any transcript, does it? That wasn't videotaped. Right. That should have been videotaped and yeah. followed up on, but it wasn't. That was my fault. It sure should have been videotaped because that's a major felony that you say and she says that she's now talking about, right? You're correct. Major felony. You're right. Thorne testified minutes after uh, the little girl wrapped up the interview. She came to her in another room and went ahead and told her that she had been molested. As you just heard, that was not on tape. Thorne went on to say that she believed that a deputy was writing that down, but the defense says there's no uh, documentation of that happening. Now, this was just uh, the end to a long day in court. Melidia Kluhl joins me now uh, to give us updates on what happened earlier in the day with another mother taking the stand. That's right. This would be the second second mom that we've heard from of one of the alleged child victims. She testified today that she met Tanya Kraft when they uh, when Kraft took a teaching job at Chickamauga Elementary School back in 2005. The mother of the second alleged child victim in this case told jurors she and Tanya Kraft quickly became best friends. They spent time in each other's homes and talked by phone every day. She said Catoosa County detectives called her in late May of 08. They told her they were investigating a case of child-on-child -child fondling and asked to interview her daughter at the Child Advocacy Center. And I said, honey, if anything else has happened, you need to tell mommy. It's cause I, I said, because you're fixing to have to talk to the police. And I said, she was scared, she was crying. And um, I said, it's okay, you haven't done anything wrong. On cross, defense attorney Scott King questioned the woman about just how much she knew about the sheriff's department's investigation. Did you know that Tanya had touched her, or had you heard anything about Tanya touching your daughter until after the interview? Not that I recall. No. But despite repeated questioning, the woman stayed with her original story that she had no knowledge the investigation was leading to Tanya Kraft. So you knew you were on your way over there to talk about misconduct. No, I knew I was over there to talk about child on child. Of course, testimony begins again tomorrow morning at 9. More testimony today in the Tanya Kraft trial. Today, another child advocate and the lead investigator were called to the stand. Hello again, everyone. I'm David Carroll. And I'm Amy Morrow in for Cindy Sexton. It's day eight in the Tanya Kraft trial. A former North Georgia teacher accused of molesting three young girls. Now, at the start of the day, the defense wanted an interviewer's testimony thrown out because she didn't document claims of abuse from the child. The judge denied that request. Also this morning, a woman who worked with the Child Advocacy Center in Fort Oglethorpe was called to the stand, as well as the lead investigator in the case. That's the work they've completed today. We have live team coverage, which begins with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Melidia Kluhl. You're right, Amy. Two witnesses on the stand today, both witnesses of the state, one a social worker, the other the detective who headed up the investigation for Catoosa County. Defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorendo spent several hours grilling Stacy Long about the way she interviewed the girls at the Fort Oglethorpe Child Advocacy Center. Had the child brought up any idea whatsoever about Tanya requesting to be touched by a child? No. That was that, that idea came from you. Well, that's a common question to ask in a forensic interview. Never the typical touches, but right. yes, I did bring that up. Okay. Lorando's repeatedly asked Long if her method of questioning suggested ideas the kids then could have entwined in their own memories of Tanya Kraft. He also hammered on the potential for parental influence with the children. 
One girl volunteered information about Kraft's marriages. And she was mean to him and her other husband, so they left her. That's what she says. Okay. Possible parental influences? I don't know. I, mean, I don't know where she got it. Possible rumor formation? Detective Tim Deal took the stand in the afternoon. He's a child abuse investigator for the Catoosa County Sheriff's Office. He told the jury he went to Kraft's house in late May of 2008. And when he mentioned the allegations, she turned so red she was almost purple. She became just flushed, almost like a fight or flight type syndrome reaction. Did you feel anything else on the Kraft's at this time? She almost, she became... She started becoming very nervous, and she, uh, I thought she was going to hyperventilate. Now, Detective Beal's testimony ended for the day shortly after 5 o'clock. We're told he will be back on the stand tomorrow morning. The defense team spends most of the day questioning an expert witness, and they hope her testimony will undermine the value of how three young accusers were interviewed by child advocates. Hello again, everyone. This trial has now lasted for three weeks solid, and the defense isn't even close to finishing. While both sides blew through multiple witnesses yesterday, today's events unfolded a little more slowly. Our court reporters are going to tell you about Dr. Ann Hazard, who she is, how she's connected to the case, and why her testimony today was limited by the judge. We also learned today about when Kraft herself could take the stand. Our legal analyst will break it all down for you. Our team coverage begins with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Melidia Cluel. Bring us up today, Melidia. Well, Cindy, defense attorneys for Tanya Kraft are trying to show that a perfect storm of problems are to blame for false allegations of child abuse, including over-anxious parents who hated Tanya Kraft, uh, botched medical exams performed by a nurse with no real experience in or education in pediatric sexual exams, and inept interviewers who the defense claims used a terrible questioning technique. Dr. Lorandos was on the, was questioning Dr. Hazard for most of the day today about uh, proper interviewing techniques of the young children. She was naming a number of potential problems, including repeatedly questioning children uh, and, uh, and other uh, main issues that they have been uh, covering in testimony over the past uh, three weeks. Here's more of what happened in court today. Dr. Ann Hazard is a clinical psychologist who teaches at Emory University. Defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos called her to the stand and asked what child psychologists learned from the infamous McMartin preschool case in which dozens of people were convicted on false allegations of child molestation. Uh, they learned that if interviewers repeatedly asked children questions, uh, the child might start to feel like their first answer was wrong. <laughs> Videotaped interviews of the girls who were allegedly molested by Tanya Kraft show Child Advocacy Center employees asking detailed, specific questions. Hazard says that's not the way it should be done. Well, it's, it's a situation you might want to ask about, but you certainly wouldn't want to provide specific information about did so-and-so do such-and-such -such when you were taking a bath. That would be a, a leading question. What? And she said over-anxious parents can contaminate their child's memory, too. So they can accidentally, usually, usually it's accidental, uh, you know, have the same impact on shaping a child's story. On cross-examination, Prosecutor Lynn Greger spent an hour mocking the questioning tactics Dr. Lorandos used with the state's experts. The forensic interviewers involved in the case were each subjected to a barrage of questioning about their knowledge of research literature about conducting child interviews. So again, if I had a witness up here and I wanted to say, so what did Mr. Smith say about this? If you didn't know, I mean, it's just silly, isn't it? I'm not sure of the context of your question. Well, I think we all are, but I'll move on, okay? He asked the renowned... Now, Gregor went on to ask the renowned the psychologist... Uh, what uh, could be uh, misconstrued in interviews um, as bad technique may actually be 
trying to uh, get as much information out of a child as possible without actually crossing the line. And Dr. Hazard did uh, go on to acknowledge that it is a very delicate balance there. Eyewitness News reporter Callie Starnes is also following the story. We have seen a great deal of contention throughout the trial. That's something we have been talking about quite a bit. We saw more of it again today. That's right. And in a hearing this morning, uh, we didn't hear all of Dr. Hazard's full testimony. That's because the judge earlier today ruled to limit the questions that the defense could ask her. Now, prosecutors argued Hazard's testimony about the interviews she conducted with Tanya Kraft, Kraft's ex-husband, and the couple's children during a custody case should not be allowed. The judge agreed, ruling the testimony was hearsay without Kraft herself taking the stand. Dr. Demosthenes Lorando cited the Georgia Supreme Court saying he should be able to question Hazard about the interviews, but Judge Brian House ruled in favor of the state. There was also a discrepancy afterwards. If the defense provided prosecutors with a copy of Hazard's sworn statement. Lorando's told the judge he sent the document to Lynn Gregor in an email. Gregor said that wasn't true, creating another tense moment. Are you saying that, a, that an officer of the court is falsifying something in the court? Well, Anne, if you don't need to raise your voice, I can hear you. And as Melidia had mentioned, we've heard uh, a lot of tense moments in court. Usually it comes from the prosecution. This was the first time that we've seen that sort of emotion in the defense team. Hello again, everyone. The defense continues to call experts they hope will discredit testimony of the three young accusers. Team coverage begins this evening with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Melidia Cluel in Ringo. Melidia? Well, Cindy, Dr. Bill Burnett was extremely critical of the state's case and testimony all day today. He picked it apart from start to finish. He said that every aspect of this process, from the moment of the girls' first disclosures, was flawed. Dr. Bill Burnett had harsh criticism of nearly every aspect of the state's case against Tanya Kraft. He called Detective Tim Deal's work a shoddy investigation, followed by inept forensic interviewers who asked too many leading questions too many times. Well, I think that by that point, the children had, had really come to believe these things. In other words, the children, having had conversations with parents, with inept interviewers with an inept therapist have come to believe that Ms. Kraft has done certain things to them, that she's evil. One child actually referred to her as the evil one. Dr. Burnett was most critical because no one explored what the children and their parents were discussing. So no one considered the possibility that the girls' stories may not be real. He was also harsh about the therapy the girls received as a result. The problem with this is that if we have the situation where this little child wasn't abused and that she simply have, has come to have these false memories or false, false um, beliefs that it happened, this kind of therapy is horrible. Defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos also used Dr. Burnett's expertise to debunk the state's attack on Kraft's character, asking if flirting with men, drinking, wearing a bikini, or being a fitness instructor correlate with being a child molester? I don't think so, because as far as I know, there's no relationship between those two things. And if anything, if, if you have that idea, you're mistaken. And so you, you then set about to try to prove your mistaken notion. Evans was originally listed as a state's witness, but they have not called her to the stand. So today the defense called her as a witness in hopes of uncovering incompetence and possibly even a payoff. Team coverage begins with Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Melidia Cluel in Ringo. Well, David, defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorando had a very difficult day this afternoon during a break. Uh, he was searching the courthouse for aspirin. He spent the day questioning Laurie Evans. So she is, as you mentioned, a defense witness, but clearly she did not want to answer the defense questions. I mean, is we there had, something wrong with your memory? We had a phone call. Hold, hold it. Is there something wrong with your memory? No, we didn't discuss the children. Is that what you're asking me? No, I'm, I'm asking you about your memory of how this happened. Is there, uh, have you ever had problems with your memory? No. Just 20 minutes into questioning, defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos was frustrated with Barry Evans' evasive answers. What would help me to recall that? Yeah, what would help you to recall that? (laughs) 
That's a difficult question to, to answer. Well, how about your treatment record, where you know things that happen in a kid's life? I think your treatment record might help you recall that. I don't know if there is any treatment, treatment record about that. In fact, Evans testified that she kept very few records of the girls accusing Tanya Kraft, jotting down notes from memory after therapy sessions. In Kraft's custody case in Hamilton County, Judge Marie Williams found Evans not credible, in part because she lied about her own mental illness. Whose records? Um, appears to be Dr. Salve's. About who? I'm assuming this is about me. I don't see my name on it. You're, you're assuming? <laughs> I don't see my name on this. Weren't you there? Was I where? Evans tried to get Judge Williams to reconsider, but had a hard time explaining that today. The letter indicates that we are objecting. Oh, well, well, that's your side. Yeah. You can't say what somebody else said uh, when they don't oh. want you to. All right. So, so that's what the law is. That's why. Don't make snide remarks like that. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Lorando's there expressing his frustration uh, with the feeling that the defense hands have been tied throughout this uh, entire trial in terms of uh, what they can enter and uh, the difficulty of uh, Georgia's hearsay law. Eyewitness News reporter Callie Starnes was in the courtroom as well today. Uh, the vagueness and evasiveness did not end uh, when Dr. Lorando's ran out of questions. No, it certainly didn't, didn't, and it continued through the afternoon, uh, specifically in regards to a theme of the color yellow. We heard a lot about the color yellow today. Tanya Kraft's family and friends were all in yellow today to show support. Uh, we even heard of Kraft's love for the color yellow from the stand. Lori Evans testified the first alleged victim told her in their meetings that the girl hated the color yellow because Kraft liked it. She even said that the color triggers memories of the alleged abuse. Uh, Assistant District Attorney Chris Arndt made reference to Dr. Lorandos wearing a yellow tie when that girl took the stand and flipping it in her face. Lorandos later addressed that accusation, taking another opportunity to highlight just how difficult it was for Evans to remember things. If so someone still had psychological problems and triggers with the color yellow, would it think it would be a, a decent thing to do? Uh, for a psychologist to come up and wear a yellow tie and flip it in her face? That would be a cruel thing to act. You asked about some psychologist flipping, flipping a yellow tie. We can't show you the rest of that bite because the little girl's name is used several times, but Lori Evans responds uh, saying that she didn't remember earlier in the day that uh, Lorandos was accused of flipping his tie, just that someone was accused of doing that. Lorandos later made mention of the girl uh, using a yellow marker to color during a forensic interview, arguing once again that the color doesn't truly trigger memories of abuse. That wrapped up the day, uh, and we will return early in the morning, we're told, with a new witness uh, for now, we're live in Ringgold. I'm here because I have been falsely accused. Don't you know that you have a right to sit there and make them prove every element of their case? Yes. Everyone in the courtroom and many folks in the public have been waiting for this day. Finally, Tanya Kraft, accused child molester, takes the stand. Hello again, everyone. The ex-kindergarten teacher said she has never sexually abused anyone. Team coverage begins with Callie Starnes, live in Ringgold. Callie. Cindy, it's hard to describe the tension that was in the courtroom today as Tanya Kraft took the stand. Dr. Lorando spent the first few minutes asking Kraft if she knew her rights. Uh, he then went through a line of uh, questioning uh, very quickly, very loudly. Uh, it spurred an objection from the prosecution, and at that point, the judge asked for a short recess. After a five or ten minute break, we went back into court and we heard from Kraft about her family, her education, and her relationships. Uh, she stated she knew it was her choice to testify, then talked about her second husband making allegations against her, and then clearly told the jury that she's innocent. Do you have any idea? Any idea at all? What might be in store for you from this happy group of uh, folks? I can only imagine. Have you sat here and listened? Have you been listening to what this charming procession of 
questions has been to your friends? Yes, I have. And my son came to me when we were still living in the same house, and he said, Mommy, I want to ask you a question. And I said, okay, and we were going through the divorce. And he said, what's a social worker? And I said, why? Because that was just an odd question. And he said, well, Daddy wants me to go talk to one and tell how you spanked me hard and locked me in the closet. So how did you work out that you're going to school four nights a week and teaching a room full of kindergartners all day? How did you work in sexually abusing children into that hectic schedule? I did not and have not sexually abused any child. That is just a small bit of what we will hear from Tanya Kraft. Court was dismissed this afternoon and will resume at 9 o'clock in the morning with Kraft taking the stand. Of course, that wasn't all the testimony we heard today. Melidia Cool joins us now. We also heard from her, her husband today. Yes, we did. David Kraft, Tanya's husband of uh, just a few years, he testified today that it was love at first sight, a whirlwind romance when he met Tanya Kraft uh, back in 2007. They dated for two months before getting married. At about 10 months into the marriage, Kraft admits he became overwhelmed with the new, new roles of being a husband and a stepfather to two young children, and uh, he simply just packed his stuff and walked out one day unannounced. Uh, they did eventually reconcile. They are still married to this day, but during that separation period, Tanya Kraft was charged with these uh, criminal offenses, and he received a call from Catoosa County investigators to come in for an interview. So you don't know anything about these accusations? And I said, no, if I did, I would have turned her in myself. David Kraft gave blunt, direct answers as defense attorney Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos questioned him about his relationship with Tanya Kraft, telling jurors his wife is a phenomenal mom and there's no way she would have abused any child. On cross-exam, prosecutor Lynn Greger asked if David Kraft heard cheering in the hall after two of the girls in this case testified. He said he did. The pause is not appropriate in this matter. There's nothing to cheer about at all for anyone. I think the fact that they survived this courtroom is something to cheer about. Don't you? Do, I don't. Do you? I, I do. think the fact that we're here I is do. horrible. Oh, I do too. I wish I wasn't here. I don't get paid by the molester. I could be back in my office right now. Okay. Is that a question? What I thought was going to be a night or two until everything got um, worked out, then turned into, I, I ended up moving in and staying with she and her husband for a while. Diane Ellis? Yes. Diane Ellis, Diane Ellis right out here and her y husband? Yes. Okay. Is this Truth for Tanya website, Diane Ellis? She's the one that did the website, yes. Is that your website? I did not do it. Are you the conspiracy theory person? No. Do you think it's a conspiracy? Um... Actually, I think it's kind of offensive to use that word. I think that what has happened is more than a travesty. I think that the experts have explained how something this horrible can happen. But um, I think there's a lot of things that have been done wrong. But I know I did not do anything to these children. So where did you live after June 1st? After June 1st, I lived at Diana's house. And... Did you ever live anywhere else? <clears throat> um, we had a bond modification, and it was at the very, very end of June. Bond modification. What's that? Um, well, up in, I didn't know until now. <coughs> until then, whenever you get arrested, you have to um, pay money and you have to bond out, and they give you restrictions on what you can or can't do. So. Um, you bond out. What do you mean? You mean to post the bail? You, you pay money. So, so did they did they come to your house with the paddy wagon and arrest you, or how did that happen? No, I turned myself in. You turned yourself in. You went over to the police and said, I'm Tanya Craft, here I am? Yes. Was there any news media there when you went in and said, I'm Tanya Craft, here I am? Um, no, not whenever I first went in. Okay. I don't have any mug shots. Who do they get mug shots from? Well, I would assume the sheriff's department, since that's where they took the mugshot. Oh, okay. So the news media got a mugshot from the sheriff's department. I assume. I didn't. Okay. I don't know. Now, when you came to court for the first time, was the news media there? Um, no. They were there when, when I got you arrested. came to court the second time, was the news media there? <coughs> no. When you 
came to court any time before the trial? Was the news media there? Um, there was one time at a termination hearing where there was a, the media, there was um, sheriffs, what do you, uh, state troopers. It was um, in August, August 15th, 2008. Okay. Um, Did you call the news media and say, hey, come on down, I'm going to make a statement? No, it was the, um, <coughs> whenever I was fighting for my job because I refused to resign because I did okay. not. So, so in August, you were fighting for your job. News media was there. You didn't call them. No, I did your not call them. Your lawyers call them, if you know? I don't know of anybody that's called them. You authorize anybody to call the media? I did not tell anybody to. You authorize any kind of media campaign? No, what do you, what do you mean? Flying over town dropping leaflets or something? I mean, do you authorize any kind of media campaign since the beginning of this? No. Okay. But you did talk to... The, uh, the TV, this Melidia woman, when she came to ask you, right? Yes. And you did go on the radio when they asked you. Yes. Did you tell the truth? Yes. Okay. When you were on the radio and you got an order, somebody sent you an order, did you stop talking? Your Honor, this is good. Yes. Again, based upon the court's previous ruling, uh, this is really not stuff that, yeah. Uh, Sustain the objection, move on. Okay, uh, so when you heard Mr. Greger question your witnesses about a media campaign, is that something you did? I wouldn't, I would call anything a campaign. When you heard Mr. Greger question your witnesses about do, uh, doing your case in the media, is that something you've done? No, I did not do a campaign. Yes, I spoke out and said I'm innocent. I did not do this, and I want the truth to come out. Yes. Okay. News at 11, I'm Greg Glover. And I'm Cindy Sexton. After weeks of testimony, jury deliberations are underway in the Tanya Craft trial. While everyone awaits a verdict, some say the trial has divided the town. Others say it's put Ringgold on the map but for the wrong reasons. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Antoine Harris talked with community members and got their take on the trial. Antoine? And Cindy, this trial has been the talk of the town for a number of months, and while we all await this verdict, many people just want to see what's going to happen next. You can call it a setup if you want, but it's the same thing. It's a conspiracy theory. They just don't like that word. Oh, I never said conspiracy theory. Tough words in the closing arguments from the prosecution in the Tanya Craft trial as the former elementary school teacher awaits a jury to decide her fate. Just down the road, Richard Acock of Chow Time has heard many people's opinion of the trial. He says business has been booming since it started. Been great. Uh, usually when they let out for lunch or on the way there or coming back, people usually stop here and uh, get a couple burgers and some drinks and they're on their way and we've just been making a killing on money and it's just been real great. He says many customers are surprised the trial has carried into its fifth week. Eager for a verdict, Joan Fryer believes this trial has made it difficult for young kids in abusive situations to come forward. Many of us are now afraid to come forward and say anything. If, if anything happens, you know, because of what they've seen these kids go through, they're afraid to tell what goes on. It's a sad situation for, for all parties involved. And uh, you hate that the world's come to that somebody has to go on trial for something like this. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to believe that anybody can hurt a child. In the courtroom, the prosecution says they believe they have enough evidence to convict Kraft. The defense, however, says she's been innocent since the beginning. You can't buy the truth, but you sure as heck can try to buy your way out of being held responsible and accountable for the truth. Remember I told you there were three things? It didn't happen. It couldn't happen the way they said. And it doesn't make sense. And deliberations will continue tomorrow at 9 a.m. And whenever the jury gets a verdict, we'll stream it live on WRCBTV.com. Live in studio, Antoine Harris, Channel 3 Eyewitness News.